Ah, <sighs> hang on. I need to mentally prepare myself for this one. Hello everyone, Hezu here. Who's ready to dive straight into a Sonic theme fever dream? What were the Sonic the Hedgehog Archie comics? I get this question a lot. Shockingly enough, a lot of people are completely unaware of the existence of this part of the Sonic franchise. I'd like to change that today. Now, some of you may or may not know, I was a crazed Sonic fan back in the day. I bought every Wii game, as many toys as I could get my grubby little hands on, and of course, made OCs, original Don't Steal the Hedgefox. Whatever eight-year-old me thought that was. <laughs> but as a young, innocent child, somehow I came walking into the local comic book store back then. A dainty, cute little place that was about to change my life forever. Most of the comics on the shelves were dark, gritty superheroes, or superheroes that simply were... not for my general audience, we'll say. Then I turned my head. Sitting right there, face to face with me, was Sonic the Hedgehog. I leaped over to it. I had absolutely no idea that Sonic had comics made of him. But they didn't just have one series. No, they had two. <laughs> Actually, they had... Gosh, I can't even list them all. They had quite a few spin-off series, too. But for me personally, there's actually the big three of the Sonic comics. Sonic the Hedgehog, Archie Comics, the original, which happens to be quite famous. It's been going on since 1992 and placed a Guinness World Record in 2008 for being the longest running comic series based on a video game. In 2015, it then became the longest running franchise based comic series that surpassed even that of Marvel Comics. Unfortunately, it was cancelled in July of 2017. A big mess that I shall dissect later. But this series is over 25 years old! That's older than me! Next to that was Sonic X, a simple side story for the anime slash TV show I'm sure many of you have watched, which ended after issue 40. Sonic Universe, which didn't debut until much later down the road, along with many older, long-since-discontinued spin-off series or bonus comics. Now this became quite an addiction. I pulled out my dusty old collection and decided to do some counting. Guys, I have 156 Sonic comics. I have 31 out of 40 for Sonic X, and 8 out of 94 for Sonic Universe? Oh my god, I, I had no idea it ran for that long. I was, wow, I was far behind for this comic. <laughs> I have 2 out of 3 for the Sonic Quest. I have 5 out of 15 for the Super Sonic Specials, along with a couple free comic book day samples. Ah, lovely days those were. To my surprise, I actually had some of the Knuckles series too, 16 out of 32. Those are really old. We're talking like 1997 to 2000s. I think it's safe to infer that I asked the counter if they had any secret stashes and was rewarded generously. There's also the mini Sonic Archive volumes, compilations of the Sonic comics from its very early years until perhaps its hundreds range. I have 9 out of 24 of those little cuties. And for Archie comic official line, I have 75 out of 290. Though, with the inclusion of the 9 volumes I have, that apparently goes up to issue 91? Meaning technically I have around 166 out of 290 of the official Archie line. So that's pretty good. But damn, this is some collecting. Each comic was roughly $2.50 back then for me, since I bought these mid-2000s. So multiply that and a little more with 156 Sonic comics, I spent... roughly $400 on all of this. And it could have been a couple hundred more if I hadn't stopped. 
though, between you and me, these comics were worth every penny. Now, I did stop quite a few years ago. I don't know why exactly, but I think I just started to lose interest. I, I don't know. I had just latched onto my bleach phase at that point in my childhood, so Sonic was quickly diminishing from my life for the first time in about six years. Sonic, though, was always an important part of my childhood. It was the first series I ever truly hyper-focused on, and perhaps was the longest hyper-focus of my life. But as mentioned, later on, I wasn't keeping up with any of the news or plot lines. Until two years ago. Sonic Archie Comics now cancelled. The longest-running comic based off a franchise came to a close. I was in shock. Because this was a good running streak, I figured it couldn't last forever, but I wonder how they ended it. To my despair, they didn't. It was cancelled. I started backtracking. I found out they actually forced a reboot on the entire comic not too long before its cancellation. What the hell is going on here? Turns out, this is all thanks to one man, Ken Penders, but I'll talk about him later. The true meat of this video is actually mostly due to this man as well. See, he was one of the main writers for the comic series. A lot of the insane plot lines I am about to list are perhaps all thanks to him. So why don't we get down to it? What made the Sonic Archie comics so crazy? Number 1. The Great War most people would call Sonic's people furries, but in the actual comic series, they are called Mobians. Now I know what you're thinking. Hezu, Eggman isn't a Mobian. He has no fur. And you're right. Eggman and his people are called Overlanders. They're basically mutated humans that became de-evolved due to a mutation implemented on a bombardic scale by aliens called the Zorda. You're confused? Oh, well, don't worry, I can elaborate. Dr. Julian Ivo Robotnik, or as we call him, Eggman, had an ancestor named Dr. Ivan Kintobor. The Zorda, a bunch of octopus-like aliens with a thirst for conquest, sent one of their people as an emissary to discuss an alliance with the human race. But guess what old kooky Kintobor did? He captured it and dissected it which caused the Zorda to declare war and release a gene bomb that destroyed a good chunk of Earth's population, meanwhile mutating the survivors. Through time, the animal species evolved to be sentient Mobians, and at some point, there's a massive war between the Mobians and what's left of the human race. That's why Eggman is always targeting Sonic and his friends, because he and his cousin Snively are basically an endangered species trying to regain control over their planet through racist means. Yeah, you'd best buckle up for the rest of this video, buddy, because if you're already lost, you're basically fucked. Number two, Sonic's family. Sonic's real name is Ogilvy. Ogilvy Maurice Hedgehog. Bet the writers had a field day with this one. Unfortunately for us, this ain't a joke. Yes, people, there is actual technical canon for Sonic the Hedgehog, where his real name is Ogilvy Maurice Hedgehog. He legally changed his name to Sonic, but his birth name is still Ogilvy Maurice Hedgehog. I'd give you more time to let that truly sink in, but this entire video is nothing but shock value. You will not have time to recover. Yes, you should be afraid. Sonic has two parents, a non-evolved dog and an Uncle Chuck. His mother, Bernadette, had a father named Maurice, which explains Sonic's middle name. We don't really know anything about him past that. His family had fought in the Great War, but his dad got shot in the head. The only way they could save him was to roboticize him. So Bernadette had spent a good chunk of motherhood caring for Sonic while her husband sat glitching mindlessly in the corner. Thanks, Jules. At some point, she gets roboticized, too. Uncle Chuck takes care of Sonic and lies to him about his parents as he gets older, basically leading him to believe they were dead so Eggman wouldn't manipulate him by using them against him. Don't worry, there's a happy ending. Sonic is reunited with his parents and they love him dearly. Point A. Kneecapian Mace, or for short, kneecaps. 
Knuckles' mom, Lara Lee, divorces his father, Locke, and remarries an echidna named Windmaker. Their child becomes Knuckles' half-brother named Kneecaps. I have no idea why this became a thing, but it is. Point B. Knuckles' dad, Locke. If you thought you had daddy issues, Nux's dad really takes the cake. Long story short, Knuckles is a living chaos emerald, apparently, because his father experimented with his eggs seconds after he was born. Yada, 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 chaos power, yada, 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 Knuckles dies and attends his own funeral. Yada, 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 Knuckles the Echidna ascends into the chaos energy plane to become a god, yada, yada, yada. He rejects it and goes back to being mortal to help his friends fight against aliens. Yeah. Point C. Knuckles' great uncle is a floating robotic head named Dimitri. He's also typically considered evil, and he was one of Enerjack's reincarnations. He's more or less the founder of the Dark Legion. Oh, uh, <laughs> don't worry. All of this will be explained in a minute. Point D. Julie Sue. Knuckles has a girlfriend named Julie Sue who happens to be a very, very distant cousin of his. Just thought I'd put that out there. Point E. Archimedes the Fire Ant. I have no idea if I pronounced that name right. But he's Knuckles' mentor. Knuckles learned almost everything he needed to know from an ant. Great. Point F. Dr. Finitivus, Technomage of the Dark Legion. Now, this guy isn't actually related to Knuckles, but I can't not talk about him. This guy was my absolute favorite Archie comic design in the whole franchise, and he is one evil bastard. He's basically an evil scientist that threatened to split Knuckles in half via warp ring closure. And he's done way more damage than just that, people. Point G. The Dark Legion and the Brotherhood of Guardians. The Dark Legion is an organization of Echidna that formed together to support the usage of technology when the rest of Angel Island went Amish. Or, actually, the proper term is Luddite, but you get the idea. Point H. Enerjack. Or as I like to call it, Knuckles as a psychotic Thor. Enerjack is a demigod of chaos who likes to take over bodies, and his favorite species to take over is usually that of Echidna. His fourth takeover was of Knuckles, thanks to Finitivus. His father Locke sacrifices himself to bring his son back, but this caused a massive fold of catastrophic events that would haunt Knuckles for the rest of his days. Point 4. Sonic's Harem Yeah, you heard me right. Sonic has a harem. Fiona Fox, Bunny Rabot, Mina Mongoose, Amy Rose, Sally Acorn, and potentially others. Out of all these girls, Sally was typically the one he shared the most romantic tension with. But here's some spice for your life. A robotic replica was created of Fiona Fox when she was younger. Tails met this robot and fell in love. Turns out, this is Otto Fiona, who was made by Robotnik to try to entice Tails and trick him into getting roboticized. Sometime later, the real Fiona escapes Eggman's prison and starts dating Sonic, much to Tails' despair. Then sometime later, it's revealed that Fiona Fox has actually been cheating on him with himself this whole time. By that, I mean she was cheating on him with Scourge, which is anti-Sonic from another dimension who turned green and wears sunglasses and a leather jacket. But let's save this dessert for a few bullet points down, shall we? Or number five, Tails' family. Have you ever wondered why young Miles Prower, yes, that's his real name, hung around Sonic ever since he was young? It's because his parents were stuck on another planet. But that's not all. Remember the Great War? Turns out, Amadeus Prower was the commanding general of the Mobians' army against the Overlander humans. For some reason down the line, Rosemary and Amadeus get tired of putting up with the monarchy, so they attempt to overthrow it to push a democracy, which ends up getting Amadeus thrown in prison. 
There's a lot of fighting, and eventually they come to an agreement to allow a democracy of seven elected officials to vote as a council. One of these members ended up being Rosemary. So Tails' parents are pretty badass. Oh, right. Uh, meanwhile, Tails apparently has an Uncle Merlin who is more or less a Jedi wizard who is learning the ways of the power of chaos. No big deal, you know. Just having an uncle who is more or less a Jedi wizard. It's cool, but, you know. Oh, and Tails is considered the chosen one to fulfill the prophecy of gathering all the chaos emeralds of the universe and banishing them with the help of Shadow to another dimension to save probably all of existence. But, you know... Just a typical Wednesday, am I right? Number six, Amy Rose. Point A. Amy Rose retained her original design from the Dreamcast throughout the comics until issue number... Um, I'll look that up later. She wanted to become a freedom fighter, but was considered too young to join. Using a power ring, she wished herself to be old enough to be able to join thus forming her into the version we know more commonly today. Although her body grew, her mind is still the same. So, Amy is literally an 11-year-old in a 17-year-old's body. I'm 11, so shut the fuck up. Point B. Amy's cousin, Robbo the Hedge. Robbo is basically a turquoise-colored Robin Hood-themed Sonic in a hoodie. He is leader of the Mercian Freedom Fighters and sent Amy to be protected in the town of Knothole when he learned her parents were captured and roboticized. Rob wifes up an echidna woman named Marianne, and the two have a son named John together. Now get this, y'all. Rob is actually the son of the ex-king of the fallen kingdom of Mercia. Amy Rose's parents were claimed to be nobles, but upon being related to Robbo, makes her fucking royalty. Amy Rose is a princess of a fallen kingdom, y'all. Mm-hmm. Oh, trust me. This gets better. Point seven. Charmy B is a prince, too. Because why not? Yeah, Charmy B. This dorky fool of a kid, part of the poor detective team of the Chaotix, he is a friggin' prince. He also has a fiancé named Saffron because the writers thought that was necessary for some weird reason. At some point, their entire civilization is captured and roboticized since Eggman just loved to colonize Mobians and enslave their people. Oh, Eggman, you wacky coot. <laughs> Go die in a fire. At some point, Charmy survives getting poisoned, but his friend doesn't make it. So basically, Charmy had a friend die before his eyes, and he had to be the one to tell his family of his passing. Like, who comes up with this? Especially for Charmy B, of all Sonic characters. I don't support the consumption of alcohol, but I'm sure someone will make a game out of this mess sooner or later. Number 8. Sonic King snaps. Issue number 126 changed my life. What just happened? Sonic snaps, and so does Eggman. Eggman, out of nowhere, just goes all out. He destroys Sonic's entire city. He destroys everything. Sonic's entire city is shown decimated, burning in flames. Everyone is gone. Eggman captured every single Mobian in the city of Acorn, while his cousin Snively distracted and destroyed the Freedom Fighters. Eggman built special armor that prevented Sonic from penetrating it. He made a shield out of a bouncer, one that Sonic should not be able to lay a scratch on. Eggman mentions Sonic reaching his limit, which makes Sonic snap. At his top speed, with all his strength, and shockingly, he only manages to dent the shield. Sonic lost. Like, look at this. He may as well be laying there dead. Surprisingly enough, 
Amy, Tails, and Knuckles manage to prevent themselves from getting captured and help Sonic save everyone who is about to get roboticized. They manage to save Charmy before he can be turned, but because the process was interrupted, Charmy gets brain damage, which causes memory loss. Pretty much everything is ruined in a single day for these heroes. They manage to pull a miracle, though, with the help of Sally's computer AI named Nicole. She had a secret project, a nanite city she was building as a backup plan, a safe house in case things went south with Eggman. Through the use of nanites, Nicole made a lynx form for herself and even became sentient. As a kid, I was shaking when I was reading this story. The writers really had me with this one. I'd say this was the most interesting and grave storylines in all of the Sonic Archie comics for me. It was pretty disturbing and extremely rare to see Sonic lose his cool like that. It's a treat to see that side of his personality for sure. Very rarely do we see Sonic lose it like this, but every time he does, hell freezes over in fear of him. Number 9. The Future some of the Archie comics and a good chunk of the Sonic Universe alternate storyline depicts the future of Mobius 25 years later. It's considered a possible future along with a separate zone at the same time. It's a little confusing. Antoine and Bunny have their two children, Belle and Jake. Knuckles and Julie Sue have a daughter, Lara Sue. Uh, Vector has a child for some reason named Argyle who has a crush on Knuckles' daughter, Lara. Not sure how the fathers feel about that. Speaking of, Knuckles' father, Locke, dies of terminal cancer in this timeline. Yeah, remember when he died by sacrificing himself via chaos energy to save his son from an evil demigod that lives within his subconscious? Yeah, I'd say Locke in the other timeline had a better passing considering the context. Still, though, it's pretty wild to know cancer exists in the Sonic franchise. Can you imagine Sonic dying of cancer? Because I certainly can't. Leenda, who is Julie Sue's half-sister, has a son named Rutan. Sonic and Sally get married, making Sonic the new king of Acorn. The two have fraternal twins, Sonya and Manic. Side comment, this naming convention is a derivative reference to the 1999 Sonic Underground TV series, where Sonic had two siblings named Sonya and Manic, the three of which just so happened to be the lost royal children of their mother, Queen Alina. God, the Sonic franchise is one wild ride, ain't it? At some point, Sonic had to go back in time to mess with some stuff to prevent the end of the world or whatever. And then he comes home only to find out his children are gone, and his wife is now wed to an overlord, Shadow the Hedgehog. So, middle-aged Sonic now goes into a crisis and ends up homeless. And Lara Sue is the only one able to really get Sonic out of his depression and help him retake his future. Yeah, the Sonic franchise is extremely convoluted and ridiculous. But... I'd be lying if I said I didn't enjoy every second of it, though. <laughs> and Tails marries Mina Mongoose, the pop singer who used to date Sonic and took a bullet for him and was dating her gothic manager, Ash, after she broke up with him. Uh, no idea how that came to be or why. Mina and Tails don't interact in the present comic series. So this is this is quite jolting. They even have two children, Sky and Melody. Uh, Amy Rose is nowhere to be found. Silver visits many timelines of Sonic's life frequently, much to Sonic's annoyance. Um, he has his own separate storyline where he's trying to find a traitor, you know, like the Idlis trigger or whatever, kind of the cause for his future timeline being such a mess, but needless to say, he doesn't ever succeed, and he's kind of the bane of Sonic's existence right now. Um, not much else I know beyond this, but I'm sure it's gotten crazier since I left the comics. Number 10, The Antis. Zones in the Sonic universe are basically alternate dimensions. 
The biggest one Sonic and Co. have feuds with is typically their anti-zone, where basically everyone good is evil and vice versa. So let's take a look-see at the characters and what changes they've gone through, shall we? The most notable one that I've mentioned previously is Scorch the Hedgehog. He used to look almost identical to his prime counterpart, aside from the sunglasses, leather, and his potty mouth. The reason he turned green was due to extreme exposure to chaos energy while trying to use the Master Emerald. If you notice the deep scars on his chest, those were given to him by Knuckles' father, Locke, who was guardian of the Master Emerald at the time. Apparently, Scorch was enough of a jerk to earn the hatred of both the Prime Zone and his own anti-zone allies. His own team mutinied against him when he had forced his way to the throne and long since abused them. Anarchy Barrel, the Chaos Emerald counterpart, was stored in Scourge's throne, allowing him to go super to fight against everyone on his own, giving him a wicked inverted color scheme. Sonic sometimes still thinks of Scourge and the famous words he had said to him once, All it takes is one bad day, and you'd be just like me. It's such a Batman-Joker complex between these two, so even if you think the anti-zone counterparts are a little... obscene, you can't help but still love them, whether as a joke or seriously. And honorable mentions of the known alternate counterparts so you can view them in all their glory. Anti-Miles with his lovely tuff of hair, Alicia Acorn, Rosie the Rascal, Pat DeColette, Onux, who wears a funny hat, Anti-Boomer, Buns Rabot, King Max, the usurped king who has a death warrant out for Scourge, his henchman Jeffrey St. Cross, and finally, the sweetheart counterpart of Robotnik, Dr. Ivo Kentobor, who happens to be a literal doctor. He's a veterinarian with great love and care for injured Mobians in his zone. What a great man. Evil personality counterparts are pretty popular these days, so I ain't shocked that the anti-zone became a thing. I am only mortified that self cess continues to thrive with all this fuel. I have... Here, here wait a second. I want to read to you um, a Scourge side note from the Sonic Archie Wikipedia page, if you don't mind. As Sonic's anti-Mobius counterpart... Scourge is very similar to him, but lacks a number of his more refined qualities. One of these happens to be a respect for women. While Sonic has multiple relationships with girls, he will nonetheless settle on one girl at a time and treat her with the utmost respect. <laughs> Scourge has always attempted to satisfy his desires by shamelessly going after several females at once. That's no good. This has gotten him into trouble on several accounts, the first ending with his banishment from the anti-freedom fighters after he was caught cheating on anti-Sally with anti-Bunny and anti-Penelope. Despite impersonating Sonic on Mobius Prime, Scourge couldn't overcome his habit and made blatant advances on Bunny Rabot, Amy Rose, Rouge the Bat, and Fiona Fox. <laughs> so, so, so Sonic says, drink your respect, women juice. Number 11, Zonic the Zone Cop. Uh, okay, so obviously multiple dimensions, or in this universe, zones, with a bunch of Sonics and his enemies are just bad news bears all around. So how do we contain these threats that may just spill out into other zones? Zone Cops. That's right, y'all. Sonic has a Zone Cop counterpart named Zonic who works under an Eggman counterpart, General Zobotnik. Yeah, just assume all characters from this multi-zone prison complex have a Z at the start of their names. So for those of you who have always dreamed of seeing Sonic and Power Ranger gear wrangling up some bad guys to throw them in jail, your dream has finally come true. Number 12. Multiple Eggmans. Eggman himself had a very extensive family. And he's actually not even the first Eggman. Heck, he's not even from the Prime Zone. The current Eggman in the Sonic franchise basically came from another dimension. I mean, I, 
I'm kind of confused on how any of this works myself. So I'm just going to show you all the known Eggmans on screen and just be done with it. Because I'm already, I'm losing my mind here, y'all. I need, I need a break. Number 13, Ken Penders. And finally, the man of the hour. The legend that built and destroyed the Sonic Archie comic franchise. Ken Penders was a writer for the Sonic comic series for quite some time. He was responsible for the creation of most of the echidnas along with the Dark Brotherhood and so on. He was a heavy asset to the story built up in the Archie comics for years. Stories that expanded character backstories and stories many fans had latched onto. And he threw it all away. Why and how? Well, it all started with Sonic Chronicles. This entire situation is one confusing mess, so I'm going to try to keep it simple for you guys. The timeline of events are as follows. A. Ken Penders writes a storyline for the Knuckles comic series sometime back in 1999 and continues with it in the Sonic comic series. B. Nine years later, Sega releases the game Sonic Chronicles that has a very similar storyline. C. Ken Penders gets upset and files copyright on all the characters he created for Archie under Sega. D. Sega and Archie fail to challenge, meaning Penders gains the rights to his story and characters he made for Archie. E. Ken Penders publicly announces he will legally protect his characters and use them for his own franchise, the Lara Sue Chronicles. This makes Archie and Sega freak out, causing them to sue Penders for breach of his work for hire contract. Archie fails to produce said contract. Archie fires their legal team over this. Ultimately, three years of this mess, and Ken Penders wins the case, forcing Archie to reboot the Sonic comic in 2013 and cease the use of Penders' storyline and characters. See, Ken had found similarities between his Dark Brotherhood versus the Nocturnus clan of Echidna that appeared in Sonic Chronicles. The two share their heavy usage of technology, their desire to conquer other races, and the fact that they were banished to the Twilight Zone. There's no explanation for why Archie and Sega failed to challenge his copyright claims right off the bat. They didn't do anything until it was publicly disclosed. If they had to pay him royalties or ask for his approval or follow his own rules for all these characters and storylines, that's too much power and not a cost Archie is willing to settle on. Sonic Chronicles infuriated Penders. He must have felt betrayed about having his work copied without any credit or approval request, but he went overboard. Ken Penders, in 2011, a year after gaining copyright of the characters he made for the Sonic franchise under Archie and Sega's name, decided he wanted to use his characters for his own original Don't Steal book series called The Lara Sue Chronicles. His stuff would probably pass the copyright test since it'd be deemed original enough to be his own series, but Penders, you're not fooling anyone with those fan characters. Isn't he blatantly stealing the Echidna designs? Yes. Yes, he is. Normally, Penders, you would be the one getting sued by Sega because you stole their character design. It's either sad irony or Penders is really that petty. <laughs> and get this, those fan characters? He claims they're not Echidna, they're Echidnia. Which are actually space aliens or something. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I know, I know. Imagine if someone at Disney did this with Frozen. It's now a TV series called Cold with Elsa and Anna, who struggle with their relationship as Elsa struggles to contain her ice powers, but in space. You see how ridiculous this is. And Penders, if you're watching this, I'm sorry, but... If people were to choose between your books and the Sonic Archie comics, I think it's obvious which one people would buy. 
Ken Penders was a writer, but he was not the only one who carried the Sonic series. If it weren't for Tracy Yardley's amazing drawings, Ian Flynn's backup support, all the colorists, printers, distributors... I mean, you were part of a team. It wasn't just you. If it weren't for Archie and Sega giving you the tools and your team, I mean, they all made you someone. Surely there was another way of expressing your frustration and betrayal to, uh, I don't know, Jay Turner and Cookie Everman? The people who wrote Sonic Chronicles? The proper people to claim stole your idea? It's not Sega as a whole, unless you can prove all the producers have read every single one of your comics and worshipped them dearly. Penders claimed at some point he'd release a book concerning this case, but as of this video, it has yet to be released. I don't know his experiences or relationships with Archie and Sega or the teams there, but from my perspective, Penders really stepped on everyone over all this. I mean, okay, yeah, screw corporate businesses, they suck. I don't know how Sega or Archie treats their workers, and working for a comic book industry is full of hard deadlines and little to no pay. As a fellow writer and artist, I feel sympathy for Penders having his work stolen, especially almost under the same roof. Had they merely credited him for inspiring the storyline, or even asked him permission to turn his comic story into a video game, this entire situation could have been avoided. I mean, to be fair, the characters are different enough, and there's more to the story than just the Nocturnus clan, so there's a small chance this could have been a coincidence. But that small section of the story concerning these clans really is exactly the same. But as a Sonic fan, I'm frustrated and disappointed with Penders. I feel like he targeted the wrong people. But the true damage Penders actually did was sever the ties between Archie and Sega that were going strong for over two decades. Sega blamed Archie for not having their legal paperwork in order. They lost money because of them. Frankly, I'm surprised they even managed to keep the comic book running three more years after this whole mess. But, yeah, that was the rise and fall of the Sonic comic series. I stopped reading these a long time ago, but while doing my research, I came across the comics I had missed out on. I actually started tearing up. The nostalgia got to me. It made me want to buy all the comics I missed out on. To have a complete collection until its inevitable cliffhanging end. Anyhow, the stuff I listed in this video is really only the icing on the cake. There is so much else that goes on in this crazy comic series that I haven't even mentioned. Hell, there's probably some things that went on that even I don't remember or know about or would take too long to explain. <laughs> I could do multiple videos over all this content. There's just so much to take in. But even with all this craziness, I admire how serious the writers and artists were taking this series. There was character development, there was war, there was victory, there was romance, there was family, there was loss, there were alternate universes, and legitimately terrifying villains. There were complexities in this story that made me come back to it every time, no matter how ridiculous it was to outsiders. Heck, I, I only even went over what happens in the main line of Archie. There were plenty of other stuff that went on in Sonic X, Universe, and Knuckles side stories that I haven't even mentioned. But the Sonic Archie comics were, and will remain to this day, the most complex and interesting Sonic franchise that Sega, or Archie, will have ever created. And that concludes my 12-page analysis of the Sonic Archie franchise. Guess we don't know how good we had something until it's gone. But it had a good run. I hope you all have become enlightened and will now devote yourself to the one true god that is Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> but for real though, thank you for joining me on this journey. I'm sure the first thought that came into your heads when you saw this was, what? Another video? Hezu actually did it? And I'll tell you, I'm as surprised as you are. But Sonic is a juicy franchise that I, embarrassingly, know too much about. So I wasn't going to miss out on this opportunity, no way, no how. 
I hope this determined attitude sticks with me for my other videos. But I hope you guys enjoyed this. I've got a bunch of ideas for what my next video will be, and I hope you guys are just as excited for the next one. I'll see you then. Have a great day. One of these happens to be a respect for women while Sonic... I'm sorry. Hang on a second. <laughs> Sonic says, drink your respect women juice. <laughs>